Matthew 13, 47 through 50. Again, I said it was going to be a short sermon. Um, I was, uh, we were taking our in-laws to the uh, causeway or honeymoon island, and I remember on the causeway, I saw a guy on a boat take his net and just throw it out into the, into the ocean. And I just thought, that is cool. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight, casting the net of the gospel. Steve pulled one out of his car the other day, and he did it right in the lawn over here. That was cool, too. It just, you know, spread out perfectly, casting the net. So we're going to talk about the parable of the drag net, or the, the, the gospel net. So it's in uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 47. And this is the last of the seven parables. Remember the, remember the gospel of Matthew is about, it's the transition or the bridge from the Old to the New Testament the promise of the king, the rejection of the king. And as they rejected the king, Jesus begins to hide the truth in parables. And so we look at the parable of the dragnet, Matthew 13. We'll read verses 47, and we'll actually go to verse 52. Matthew 13, 47 to 52. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. Which, when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Verse 51. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. So this is known as the parable of the dragnet. And, and the main uh, idea here is that the church, or at least the application that, which I'm going to draw from this, is that the church should be busy casting the net of the gospel into the world that men might be saved. And real quickly, it's the last of seven kingdom parables. Jesus pictures fishermen dragging in a cast or a net behind their boats with lots of fish. They pull it onto the shore where net, uh, the, fish, the trash fish can be separated from the valuable fish. And so Jesus is, actually explains the parable by saying that at the end of the age, at the end of the church age, God's angels will separate the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into the furnace of fire. So real quickly, if you have your outline there, I'll just explain to you the, the quick meaning of the parable. Okay, the net represents the gospel net, the gospel which would catch fish. Specifically, this is toward the end of the age, at, during the time of the Great Tribulation. The sea represents the world of people or the nations. The fish represents the visible manifestation of the kingdom. In other words, the people of God in the church age. And then D, fishermen. The fishermen would eventually separate the good from the bad. And Jesus interprets this at the end of the age. The angels will separate the true from the false. And th those who are true will enter into the millennial kingdom. So like the wheat, the parable of the wheat and the parables, right? it gives us a picture of, of, the, of the coming judgment at the end of the age. The Messianic kingdom, the prophecy of the Messianic kingdom was to begin with the separation from the righteous and the unrighteous, the wicked. Only the righteous would enter in, and so the mystery form of the kingdom that Jesus inaugurated ends with the separation of the wicked and the just at the end of the age. So at the end of this church age, before the thousand-year reign, this is where the separation will occur. During the current age, the church age, which we are in, there will be wheat, there will be true believers. There will also be tares or false believers in the field until the harvest time. There will be good fish and bad fish until the day of separation. Since the days of Jesus on the earth, the visible expression of the kingdom will contain the truly saved and also those who are false converts. In other words, the elect, the reprobate, the saved, and the lost. But in the meantime... We need to be sowing the gospel. So what, do we, what does it mean now as we are casting the net? We must be fishing for people. And we shared a lot of that testimony tonight. We are to be engaged in fishing for men. 
Satan, as we knew from these kingdom parables, is busy sowing false converts into the church. Satan is actively opposing the gospel work. He is actively sowing or putting in false doctrine in with the truth of the church. So he is opposing every advance of the gospel every way that he can. The picture of casting a net is a little bit more um, active and aggressive than sowing seed. Remember how he said the kingdom of heaven would begin? It would be like a farmer sowing seed. But now the picture is this is a net and a net covers. This is a mass approach to bringing in fish. So how do, we, how do we interpret this? How do we understand this? The gospel message is confrontational. right? People will get angry at you for saying that Jesus is the only way. People will get angry at you for, for saying that they're sinners. Uh, it all depends on how you approach it, though. Okay, I've told people that they're sinners, and they couldn't stop laughing because they knew they broke the law. I would go over every one of the Ten Commandments, and, and, and by the end, they're like, then no one's innocent. No one's going to heaven. And I would say, you're exactly right. None of us are good enough. There are none righteous, not one. And so we are to cast this gospel net. If you remember Peter and Andrew, what he said, Jesus said this, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men, Mark, or Matthew 4, 19. Remember the apostle Paul. If the Christians, the true we, do not do this, if we don't sow the gospel seed, who will? Turn to Romans 10 real quickly, and let's get reminded about our responsibility to cast the net and to cast the gospel. Romans chapter 10. Beginning in verse 14. How then... Shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring forth glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So they will not get saved if they do not hear the gospel. So our responsibility is to preach, proclaim, live the gospel. What is the purpose of the church? Okay, Make no mistake about it, Jesus said it in every one of the gospels and in the book of Acts. In Matthew, he said, all authority is given unto me. He's the king. All authority is given unto me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Right? So... That's a, let me just read to you the four gospel statements from the four, or the four great commission statements from the four gospels. Just in case if you missed it, this is our responsibility. Matthew 28. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, or end of the world. Luke 24, 47. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. John 20, 21. Then, see, then Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. That's our responsibility, to go and proclaim the gospel. We're to cast the net of the gospel. Acts 1.8. We don't do it in our own power. Acts 1.8 says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both unto Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and all the uttermost parts of the earth. So there, there's the purpose of the church. We're to make and mature disciples. And as we make and mature disciples, Jesus is glorified. The obligation, again, that we have, because we have experienced the forgiveness of God, we are to share that experience as well. So all who have been forgiven should become fishers of men. From henceforth, as Jesus said, thou shalt catch men. That's our responsibility. Are you doing your part with the gospel? Now let's look at the end of verse 47 as we move 
after we talk about casting the net, now we're going to talk about the fish. At the end of verse 47, it says, And gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but cast the bad away. So there will be fish of every kind. Just like the other parables of Matthew 13, the great net's going to describe a mixture of people. Right? Good fish, bad fish. True wheat, false tares. So there will be that mixture during this, this phase of the kingdom of God. There will be good and bad fish in the church. We're going to see a mixture of false converts and true, genuine, and fake. Because you remember, there's examples in the New Testament. Jesus had his Judas. Philip had his Simon Magus. Paul had his Demas. So there will be a mixture of false and true as we seek to win the lost to Christ. There will be good and bad fish as well. At the end of the age, according to the last verse here, the wicked will be separated from the righteous, the good fish were put in the vessels, the bad fish were cast away where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's going to be a separation taking place at the end of the age. This separation specifically will occur when Jesus returns to establish his millennial kingdom. That's the basic thrust of the message. Get the cast, cast out the gospel message. There will be a mixture of true and false. God will do the separating at the end. And then Jesus asked the disciples, do you understand? Now, he just had given seven parables about what the kingdom would, would be like. And he compared them to being these, they're going to be the scribes now. They had Old Testament truth. They had old truth. Now Jesus just gave them new truth about the kingdom of God. What are these that they have learned now and they're responsible to teach? Number one here, they knew about a kingdom over which the Messiah would rule, right? He would rule and reign, but they did not know when the king came, the Messiah came, it would be rejected. They didn't know that. The disciples knew that the kingdom of God would include righteousness, but they did not know that it would include evil that would grow with it. Jesus pointed to a new truth, that between his re rejection and his second coming, his mystery phase of the kingdom would be characterized by both false believers and true believers. So this era, like, like the grain of mustard seed, remember what he said? It would begin small, and it would grow into a great kingdom of many people professing to believe, but not everybody here in Christendom are true believers, correct? You would, under, you would agree with that. So once this process began, it was not going to be stopped. God is maintaining his people Israel. He's going to come back and deal with his people Israel. If you remember the Daniel 70th week, he will deal with them again. And then he is also creating his church. So the question for you and I is what are you doing if you, are, you and I are part of God's program, the church, if you and I are supposed to be busy preaching the gospel and making disciples, casting out that gospel net, we have to ask the question. We went over seven kingdom parables. There's going to be faults and true. There's going to be wheat and tares. There's going to be good fish and bad fish. Are you good fish? Are you a true and genuine believer? Or are you just pretending? The Apostle Paul would say it this way, or Peter would say, make your calling and election sure. Paul would say, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. So are you among the true or the false? If you are among the true, have you, are you actively Sowing the gospel seed of the kingdom. As you are going, Jesus said, make disciples. Yeah, have your programs, plan it. Have evangelistic thrust in the church. We'll do these things. But as you are going, as you're running across coworkers, as you're talking to the gas station guy at the end of the street, are you doing your part to sow the gospel seed that men might be saved? Are you casting the gospel net? 
get involved. Do it somehow. Pick up some tracks from the wall. Get the church business cards. Be active. Be mindful. This is, we, we get to be a part of God's work on the earth. And we sung about it tonight. Lord, lay some soul upon me. Preached about it. I try, by God's grace, to do it every Sunday to have a gospel invitation to respond for salvation. Let's be a part of what God is doing on the earth that men might get saved and Jesus Christ might be glorified and magnified upon the earth. At this point in time, I'm going to give you a minute where you, okay, you have to look at yourself. Be honest with yourself. Am I sowing the gospel seed? Am I prayerful about uh, the church's outreach? Am I faithful individually about speaking to people about Jesus Christ? If you're not comfortable yet, we'll do some training. We'll do some training ahead. But are you sharing the gospel? Are you praying that the lost would be saved? You know, we've been praying that, you know, God send us to people who are looking and searching and send them to us and send us to them. It's been happening. The gentleman who saw the sign, the lady who called last uh, Sunday night, it's been happening. God is answering prayer. I hope you are part of it so that you can rejoice when we see new people saved and added to the church. All right. I'm going to give you a half a minute to pray, and then I will close in prayer.